You are an absolute visionary. It has been amazing watching your journey. You're inspiring so many people. Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson, and I am beyond excited to have finally been able to sit down with the one and only Katherine Cartman from The Garden Shed. Thank you so much for taking time today to be with us today. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. I'm so excited to be on my very first podcast. <laughs> very exciting. Well, we have been friends for years now, and we have both yep. followed along in these journeys that we've been on. And Catherine has an absolutely gorgeous lavender farm that she chronicles on From the Garden Shed on Instagram. So definitely check her out. I know there's other ways we can follow you too. We'll get to that towards the end. Um, can you, um, well, first of all, I want to talk about just if you look at her page, the exquisite beauty of the page, it is so well curated. Um, and then it's been absolutely wonderful to watch you create your wreaths, take your farm to market products that are just so soothing and calming, just even in the photos. So it's been wonderful to do that, to be able to watch you. You are in Canada. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are, what type of growing temperatures you have, and then ultimately how you started your farm? Sure. So we're based um, north of Vancouver, um, BC. So if you go up the Sea to Sky Highway um, and you're familiar with Whistler, where the 2010 Olympic Games were, we're just about 30 minutes north of Whistler in a agricultural valley. So you sort of come down from about 2,100 feet to about 300 feet. And we've got a beautiful agricultural valley where we're situated in a meadows um, surrounded by mountains on either side. And uh, we moved out, we've been in BC. I'm not originally from here. Um, I was a prairie girl growing up, ended up in Ontario and Toronto, but we moved out here in 2010 and then uh, subsequently moved away from Squamish to here in 2017. We bought some land. We were looking for some privacy, but and uh, we got it because we're surrounded by cedars, which is why we're called Cedar Grove Estates. Um, but once we built our home, there was quite a bit of land um, at the back of our land. And I figured that's a lot of like a lot of landscaping. Um, and I was looking for work because I had, you know, left um, sort of the kind of work I was doing in a town. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to start a little farm. And my husband sort of looked at me kind of like oddly, like, what do you mean a farm? <laughs> And I said, well, I got to do something. And um, we are uh, we are known in, in Pemberton Meadows for our seed potato and organic vegetable. There are some flower farms, lots of uh, ranching. Um, but where we're located, we're on a creek bed. And so our soil isn't as fertile as in the meadows. And so I decided I was going to grow some kind of flower and it, it sort of evolved. It wasn't like I came here moving, thinking I was going to do a lavender farm. It was like, what could I do with this, with this soil? Because it's very poor. Uh, my background is horticulture. I manage garden centers and I loved perennials, trees and shrubs. So I thought it had to be in that realm. Maybe I could grow something in that particular area. And through my research, I thought, well, I could, no one's doing it out here. Why don't I try something really unique and different? And, um, and I was, I was a floral, I had a floral design background and a horticultural design background. And I thought I got to find something that I can make something with. And, um, lavender seemed to be a perfect fit. We have very hot, dry summers here. Um, I'm going to talk in Celsius. I apologize for anyone. I'm not very familiar with Fahrenheit, but we're, we get here about 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. I think it's about 80, 85, maybe around there. Um, we're, our zones in the U.S. are uh, in Canada are a little different than the U.S., but we're zone 5A. Um, so we get down to minus, usually the coldest we get is minus 20 degrees Celsius. And as I mentioned, we get up to about 35. Sometimes, well, during the heat dome event that we had a couple years ago, it got to 49 degrees Celsius, which was ridiculous. Um, our soil here is um, sandy, silty, silty rocky, um, you know, on the creek bed. Um, we have a high water table here in Pemberton because we are an alluvial plain um, carved out by the glaciers and, and water. So um, the conditions, the soil conditions change quite a bit through the meadows, but where we are located, it's quite, um, quite sandy, silty and rocky. So not great nutritious soil to grow anything um, that really requires lots of nutrients. And so we decided um, after doing some research, I thought, well, let's try lavender because no one else is doing it. 
And what year was that that you started the farm? We started, uh, we moved here in 2017 and I started to get the land ready that year, but we planted our first uh, lavender crop in 2018. Amazing. And I love to hear that you went from working in the town to like just taking the leap to, to buying a farm and moving on to farmland. And then now everything that you've created, I mean, it is unbelievable what you've done in just a handful of years. Yeah, it's literally been, um, there was nothing here. They had cleared, we're in a little community of 20 different um, uh, three acre, two and a half, three acre lots. So not very big, uh, a huge amount of land. Um but I, um, but I thought, you know, it's, I had enough, I had about a, about a quarter of an acre that I could work off of. And, um, I thought that was a good start. My intention was once I figured it out, maybe I could purchase some more land and expand on it once I sort of, cause it was such a new crop. Um, and we were sort of pioneering this type of crop in this area. So I thought, you know, start small <laughs> before we take those big steps. Um, and it's, uh, it's been keeping me busy enough that, um, you know, there's obviously ways that we could expand, but land prices have gone extremely high in the last few years. So I've been finding other ways to expand uh, my lavender crop growing. So tell us about when you were developing that, your because it's a very large, so it's about a quarter of an acre. It's a pretty large plot of the rows, the mounds of lavender. What types of lavender are you growing? So we grow, we started off with 12. Um, and um, we've got four quadrants that we've sort of divided up because it was our it was our backyard and we sort of have it, we have a dike that we face. Um, I didn't I didn't want it to just sort of look like a you know plot of land with rows on it. I wanted to have some kind of architectural structure and some some landscape sort of feel to it. So we we created four quadrants um, with a steps going up the dike um, with intentions of planting lavender on either side. And um, we started off with 12 because we, we didn't really know what was going to do well here. Um, I, I started, I, I had about three quarters angustifolias um, and the others were cross intermedias. Because of our zone, we can't grow um, the very tender, you know, Mediterranean type lavender varieties like um, the dentatas or any of those true French um, and Portuguese varieties. So I chose obviously plants that were zoned for our area. And uh, we started off with 12. And the first the first, the first first spring following our, our um, planting, I lost 50% of my crop from the winter. And um, which was devastating because <laughs> you're so excited about what you're doing. So over the years, we've been modifying. We didn't plant the first year on the dike. We started with the four quadrants. Um, I, ended, I ended up having two quadrants starting with the cross intermedia, sort of that fr French variety, and two English. Um, I ended up eliminating one complete um, French variety and went three quadrants um, on Gustafolias and decided to plant the French on the dike um, because I figured with better drainage and more exposure, they would, you know, some exposure, they would, they would do better there. Um, and that didn't prove to be too good either in the second and third year. So we've just been sort of modifying. So now we're down to nine, um, and we have three varieties of cross intermediates. We do Provence, uh, we do Grosso, and we also have Phenomenal, which is phenomenal. Um, it performs really, really well in, in pretty much anywhere. Um, so I'm really, really happy with that. And then in the Augustifolias, we've got, um, Munstead, which I wasn't, you know, I, I planted it because I knew it was a real tough one. It's, it's, it's a pain to harvest because it's so small. Its stems are so small, but I use it a lot for my wreaths. Um, I have a Royal Velvet. I have Fulgate, which is, is really another great variety. Um, Royal Purple, Hidcoat Blue, which I love. Okay. Um, and then Royal, uh, we have a Sachet variety. So those are the key varieties that we're growing. And in the last two years, my neighbor next door was looking at opportunities to get farm status. And she approached me about growing some lavender for me because it was one way that I could expand without taking down more trees here. And so she's growing um, Phenomenal and uh, Provence for me. So she's growing primarily the cross intermedia and also some more hip coat blue. So in total, we have about now about almost 1,200 plants. Wow. 
That is incredible. Now, is there any special soil preparation? Because I would imagine it gets pretty cold there, right, in the winter. So is there anything? Yeah, you can do so the we have the added challenge of um, having these, it doesn't get super cold for a long time, but we get these Arctic outflows that seem to be coming more and more often, um, which brings us down into the minus 20s. Um, our soil, because we have high water table, you've got to be careful with saturation. We get like water just sitting there and then freezing. So I thought I had a slam dunk because, as I mentioned earlier, we have that sandy, silty, rocky soil, but um, didn't take into consideration um, how the water wasn't draining very quickly. So in the first year, before I even put a plant in the ground, we did uh, pits all throughout the backyard, uh, two foot um, pits, and we watched how the water was draining. Um, and recognized that it was sitting for longer than 24 hours. And so I had to cart in probably five big dump trucks worth of soil, which um, was a very sandy mix. So we, we, did, we didn't go like, you know, although lavender doesn't really need nutritious soil, but when you're planting new crops, you, you know, those first two years are really important. So it did have some compost in it, um, but it was a very sandy light mix. Um, and we had to hill every row about 14 inches to keep those roots away from any kind of contact where water might be settling. On top of that, I put French drains. <laughs> so my lavender is very expensive <laughs> to grow. Um, we, we, it was just as an added, um, we noticed some that water was pooling in that first year in certain areas. And I just didn't want to, you know, water's the worst thing for lavender. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we were pulling that water away from the beds. So we put French drains in each row um, just to, as an, uh, sort of an insurance policy. And um, so had to bring in a fair bit of uh, soil medium to bring in to row. And then we did uh, landscape fabric because the weeds can just go, as, as anyone knows, can attest to that sometimes, and especially here, they just go crazy. So we ended up um, putting landscape fabric on every row Ir and irrigation because in the first few years they do need some of that extra support as they're getting established, um, especially in the middle of the summer when it's super dry here. We can, um, we're sort of, uh, we, we go from these extremes of really, really wet springs and winters and to extreme drought and heat in the summer. And so the plants need something. Um, even though the, the water tables can be high, they still still need them and especially the younger plants. So once they're established, you know, we, we put them on the irrigation on once or twice a week during the heat of the summer for about 20 minutes each time, just so that they're, 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 they're sort of getting what they need, but it's not too much that they're, they're suffering. Are you using any specific type of fertilizers for the farm? Yeah. Yeah, for the the uh, transplant, we used a uh, an organic uh, transplant fertilizer to stay. It was it wasn't a water. It was just a, a granular that we put in the in the hole when we planted um, with a little bit of glacial dust, uh, an organic glacial dust that we added. Um, and then after every pruning every year that after we finish pruning and um, sorry, harvesting, not pruning, harvesting the lavender, we'll give them just a, 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 an organic all purpose fertilizer just to help them flush out, get some strength before they have to, and help them get them sort of hardened off for our, our, our winter season. So just usually once a year is, is what we do. And it's generally after the harvest season, once they've gone through a little bit of a, a cutting. And so is that also when you're pruning them? When do you prune your, your um, lavender? Uh, so there's a couple of times because we're a commercial farming type practice versus a gardening practice. Um, we generally will do a pruning uh, after the, right after the harvest, because the harvesting, you're, we're using grass knives and it's not always a really perfect uh, cut. So you get these uneven sort of shrubs. So once we're done, we'll go back in late August here and that'll depend on the zone that you are. You might have some areas, because we're in the mountains, you know, frost can get here pretty quickly. So the first year I thought, oh, I have lots of time. I'll do it in September because frost isn't here till October. And that just wasn't enough for our lavenders to really harden off. So I try to get ours done late August. So it's usually late summer, early fall, what I usually recommend, but we do it in August. And um, 
Now that they're quite large, I use a hedge trimmer, um, a small handheld hedge trimmer to, to trim them back. And we haven't yet got to propagation um, because we've had a couple of years that have just been crazy with weather. And because they were still quite young, um, they, we were waiting about three to four years to get them established before we started even propagating. Um, so we haven't yet got that. But if we were propagating during that pruning session in late summer, we would actually be doing cuttings um, from some of those plants, the strongest plants. And um, the ones that we aren't going to be taking cuttings from, we would just go after them with a hedge trimmer to, to clean them up. And we try to get that nice, tight, round ball um, which gives them the structure to support any snow weight um, and keeps them nice and healthy and not too leggy. And then we may have to do, we may have to do some in the spring. Sometimes we get winter damage um, or they flush out funny and we just want to make sure that they, they're going to, they're going to perform to their best. And so in May, um, you know, depending when the snow melts here, <laughs> we can have an early spring or we can have a late spring. Last year was a very late spring. So we weren't cleaning up until like June, but usually it's around May. So I, uh, we're already like, we've used a lot of our time right now. So, and we haven't That's even gotten into like, we haven't even started. Um, so one of the things I want you to touch on, and we are going to have Catherine back um, probably multiple times just because there's so much to cover with you, but tell us <laughs> about, so you started this farm, now you've got everything moving what brought you to the next step of bringing your products to market and what were some of the products that you kind of dreamt of bringing and, and what did you bring first? Sure. So um, because it takes about three years to get established a lavender and to get a real true enough crop to do anything, I mean, we're not big enough to do any distillation. Um, we can now, um, but we just weren't big enough to do that. So I wasn't creating oil. So I, I knew I was going to be drying and using buds. So my first thing was to create sachets because everyone can utilize those in so many different ways, either potpourri or under their pillow or in their drawers. So that was one of the first products I did. And because we, we do grow a lot of angustifolias, um, and because we've got such a food-based sort of community here, I really wanted to start focusing on developing some culinary products to sort of tie in with what we're doing here in the community. So just straight culinary buds for cooking, baking, all sorts of things. I also created an herb de Provence mix, um, infused sugar, which you can also use as a, a bath and body scrub. Um, so those are sort of the things that I started to develop. And it's just sort of grown from there into lots of different opportunities. And the other thing, I think my biggest thing was wreaths because I am a designer and, and making the lavender wreaths and teaching people how to make wands, how to make those French lavender wands. So there was some crafting obviously that I had to bring into that as well. And can you touch on that? Because your wreaths and your winter planters are absolutely some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Oh, how, did you, you. how did you learn how to do this? Like, tell us about if someone wanted to get started in doing this to learn how to do their own planters or how can someone get started? Yeah. So I, I was really fortunate, you know, being that I was brought up in the prairies and we, I came from a farming family. Um, we were always, you know, working with our hands in some, some way. And my mother was always got us into crafts. So I think, you know, having that sort of foundation of getting, uh, working with our hands got me an early start in getting creative. Um, and I've been in the horticulture industry. I managed garden centers and we did lots of workshops in those garden centers. And I really enjoyed helping with those. Um, I have a merch merchandising and design background. So again, you know, a bit of a, a visual art and floral design. So I think if you're starting out and you're looking to get into how do I get creative with flowers or plants, um, you know, working in a garden center or a floral shop will give you some of those techniques that you need to do. I mean, we're so fortunate now that we have a lot of YouTube videos and things out there to help teach you. But um, for me, it was, I just, um, I just took advantage of some of those, those, those talents and skills that I had learned along the way. I've been I'm 55 now, so I've had quite a few years of <laughs> working in the industry to catch and learn along with other people. Um, and it, it's my passion. I just get so much joy out of doing it. And I love that it's, um, that we're utilizing botanicals, um, to create art. 
Well, I mean, even in the photos that you take, I mean, that's another facet. Like you post these pictures, I guess it's of the creek bed then, right? Of like the area yeah. near, I mean, it yeah. is like they should be posters. I mean, they're fabulous in magazines. I mean, there's just, you have such an amazing eye for everything Thank that you touch. I mean, it's really, ins I mean, you have inspired me tremendously. I mean, even oh, in looking at your winter planters and seeing like how you were putting the pine cones, where are the, where you're placing this and that, and, and the different things that you're using, you know, the different types of plants. Tell someone if they're local to you, what types yep. of programs? I know you've got some workshops. You've got your fabulous greenhouse. We didn't even get to touch on that. Um, tell us about people that are lucky to be close enough to you. What types of programs and things that you offer to help to help share your knowledge? Well, we just came off the holiday season, so I tend to do a lot of wreath making workshops um, in person. I also have some do-it-yourself kits online that people can purchase, and then I have a video. Um, link to a video tutorial that they can follow um, at, at their home in the convenience of their of their own home with their friends. Um, this year, we are planning to do um, sort of more sort of collaborations with some really unique places. So, uh, and next week we're doing one at Ancient Cedars Lodge. They have this beautiful geodome. We're doing a terrarium workshop where I bought these beautiful um, recycled glass terrariums from France, and we're going to be creating these gorgeous little tropical gardens for people to enjoy during this or the doldrums of, of the winter. Um, and we are looking to do, you know, near around Valentine's Day for a Galentine sort of workshop to make a little uh, heart wreath out of willow, uh, lavender, and some preserved material. Um, and then the spring, we will definitely, we're planning on creating some more kits and do it yourself because we just find that it's hard for people. I mean, I've been traveling quite a bit and it's been exhausting going up and down the highway. It's, you know, um, trying to, to create these sort of areas. So we thought we're just going to stay local this year in Pemberton, reach out to some of these beautiful farms and some locations where we can create this more of like a retreat type workshop. And, um, and then create more do-it-yourself kits and videos um, to help teach people how to create, you know, reeds, container gardens, um, anything that, that's sort of plant-based. <laughs> Are you shipping any of your products and kits out to the United States? Yes. So we, right now, currently from our online store, ship both Canada and the U.S. Um, we can't necessarily ship fresh material across the border, although cuts are fine. It's just doesn't, we're not sure if it's going to get there in the way it left, but any of the dried material and, and some of it, what I'm doing is we'll ship you some of the materials and then some of the things you can buy locally just to sort of supplement. So if we, we can't send it all to you and you, we know that you could get it at a garden center or floral shop, then we'll send all those plus the step-by-step -step or video um, link to do it. And then they'll be able to complete the project. But yes, both Canada and US. So Catherine, our friends at Petra Tools want to give you a gift to say thank you for spending your time with us today. So I have two products for you that we're able to ship to Canada. So I'm going to let you know what they are and then you pick your favorite, okay? First up is the revolutionary grass paint. It will take the dull dundrums of, uh, you know, winter and turn your lawn into looking like it's mid-July. It's fabulous. Love this stuff. Non-toxic, safe for kids and pets, all the good stuff. So grass paint. Or, and I think I know the answer to this, the fabulous worm tea. So better, you know, it's wonderful for indoor house plants, outdoor, especially getting your indoor house plants, things that they can't get being indoors. This brings that stuff inside, um, all the beneficial um, nutrients, microorganisms, all the good stuff. And then of course it's fabulous for outdoor plants. So what's it gonna be? It's gonna be the worm tea because I don't have a lawn. <laughs> <laughs> and I have lots of plants. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, they're going to love it. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you. It. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell our listeners and viewers where they can find more information about you? Sure. So um, I do spend a lot of time on Instagram and I really appreciate that, that feedback because it's, it, you know, to create a great um, page and get the following. Um, it's been, it, it does require work. It doesn't happen naturally. It's a lot of work. Um, so my Instagram from the garden shed is a great way to find all the inspirational things that we do. Uh, my website from the garden shed.ca, um, is another location. I have a Pinterest page. Um, and that is, I think if I can remember correctly, it's FTGS Pemberton, uh, that you can find me there. And also on Facebook, 
um, which is um, from the Garden Shed BC. So those are sort of where I'm focusing. We are going to be switching our website this summer, early summer. We're moving from, uh, we're going to an eat more e-commerce friendly um, space through Shopify because um, we are gearing more to get more of those types of things out there and just make it a little bit easier for people who are navigating on the website. But um, so my website is definitely another place where you can find more about my story and, and follow along and, and connect to those types of services and products. Well, I have to say you are an absolute visionary. It has been amazing watching your journey. You're inspiring so many people. And um, yeah, I mean, I definitely would love to have you back again so we can talk more about the wreaths and have you show some of your products. I mean, we're, they're going to put some pictures up and things um, that you've provided us with, but it's just, you're amazing. And thank you so, thank so you. much for taking the time to be with us today. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Yes, me too. Thank you again for having me. Yes, thank you. Take care.